So this talk is called Into the Bowl of Night. And this is the book I'll be dealing with. It says things that are different to other textbooks on relativity. It was published in 1968 and is based on lectures given at a university. The foreword is by Herman von D, who's a mathematician and cosmologist. He's sort of fairly famous in that. Unfortunately, the writer of the book does not seem to be famous. So, Bondi starts the foreword and says the following. The life of a scientist has many attractive and admirable features, but one respect exists in which he feels greatly restricted. It is no relief to know that these, this restriction has been imposed by ourselves and lies in the form which our publications can take. The scientific paper is a reasonably good vehicle for expanding in a brief fashion as one can contrive some step to forward that one may have taken. Uh, but there are demands which understand be enough the editor of any reputable journal will place on scientific papers. They must be concise and there must be no irrelevant matter. Of course, there can be some divisions of opinion about the nature of relevance, but the convention has become established that the historical outline, the philosophical rumination, even a discussion of how the the author himself arrived in the first instance at his problem and then at his results are all rather out of order, i.e. they're not to be published in the science paper which you're talking about your issue. Bondi continues, while those restrictions may be essential and understandable in any age of rapid scientific advance, they nevertheless mean that when the scientist wishes to express himself in a broader and perhaps more intelligible fashion, or when he tries to communicate thoughts and ideas which may be of didactic uh, importance, even if they do not represent anything startlingly novel, then he cannot do so in the form of a scientific paper. Of course, one can write a book, but this is a very major undertaking one does not go in for lightly. As a result of these restrictions, there exists in science a substantial body of knowledge, which is referred to as folklore, something that is unpublishable, but is expressed in lectures, in conversations and so on. So my note on that, it's interesting that this thing called folklore, while we're dealing with relativity, there is a folklore about relativity and it's not going to be in the scientific papers. Instead, it's going to be in lectures and in books published by the people doing the lectures. Bondi continues, of course, it is our own fault that we don't write books more regularly. But anybody who has ever undertaken this task knows how very much work is involved. I'll leave you to read the rest for a few moments. So hopefully you've made a quick read and we go on to the next slide. So if you read what Bondi says, uh, Bondi doesn't agree with everything Dixon says. There is a conflict of beliefs. And that's one of the things I usually like to highlight. There is no complete agreement in the physics, physics establishment about things. Uh, so jumping ahead now to 
to where Dixon deals with relativity in his book. So this is uh, what Dixon says when, when he starts going on about relativity. He talks about the ether. I'll leave you a few minutes to read that. So on to the next slide. Hopefully you can read very fast. So this is continuation of what he, Dixon is saying. And so ether was an important concept for making sense of Newton's physics. So is it, what it was, one of the things it's saying is Newton postulated an ether to account for action at a distance. The, the fact that objects such as the moon and earth interact via gravity and that's action at a distance without contact is sort of mysterious and ether is supposed to be how that works. So passing over the problem with the light wave theory as to whether it is longitudinal or trans what reverse wave etc. Dixon goes into a lot of detail about that. Dixon then goes on to say about this about ether wind Hopefully you're reading very fast. My voice goes on, goes when I start reading this. So on to the next one. Right, so Dixon gets this uh, equation for length contraction. And one of the things to note, cannot detect the contraction. A fact that is often overlooked by many relativity believers nowadays. Dixon carries on and he says this. And Dixon says all these things. And it's interestingly weird, I think, because it's not something Einstein mentioned as far as I'm aware. Dixon says, now on the principles of Newtonian dynamics, there is at first sight nothing very special about the velocity of light. And I'm thinking he's really meaning the speed of light. Speed is not quite the same as velocity. No reasons appear why a force applied for a long time should not accelerate a body to as high a velocity as we please much higher, for instance, than the velocity of light, or if you increase the speed to higher than the speed of light. Uh, we can imagine a remarkable consequence which might arise from so fast a motion through the ether, and that's similar to a sonic boom produced by aircraft flying faster than the speed of sound. It is conceivable that shock rays might be set up in the ether moving at the speed of light and in principle they should be detectable. Perhaps the existence could be inferred in another way as the shock waves would carry away energy from the moving body. Its velocity would fall back again to the speed of light. And this time he's using the word speed of light instead of velocity. Unless we could arrange to supply it continually with energy to make up the loss. If this were the case, bodies moving faster than light would apparently not obey Newton's first law of motion. And that is why noting as interestingly weird. Uh, 
However, he's pointing out what he's just said is speculation. And he's just pointing out that Newtonian dynamics might be wrong. Uh, Man-made rules might not be ultimate truths. And in my view, he's probably speculating from a false connection between Newtonian and Einsteinian physics. And you see my video on that, which is entitled Development of Einsteinian Physics from Newtonian Physics. And that's explaining how the mainstream got the connection between Newton and Einstein wrong. So that's probably what he's going by. Dixon's probably also going by this wrong connection between Newton and Einstein, which I've spotted. Dixon carries on. For bodies traveling closer to the velocity of light, the Lorentz contraction has a strange consequence. And it's pointing out when vehicles see that, then the length becomes zero. So Dixon has an interesting take on the equation. He says, when we are faced with consequences of this kind, it is time to look more closely at what we're doing, for it probably means that we have imposed some hidden man-made conditions on the phenomena of nature. So what he's doing is, his take on it is, he's not believing absolutely in the equation, and he's going to believe the equation when it gives an answer he doesn't like, it might be wrong. He's not going to believe an equation if it gives an answer he doesn't want to believe in, which is a kind of strange point of view. Dixon carries on. I'll let you read this for yourself. But my, my thoughts on it. So he still has the ether concept. He has motion relative to it, which is treating as absolute motion and is wondering if to abandon absolute motion in favour of just relative motion. It does not, does not seem an approach that relative detects nowadays take to talk about motion in context of ether. Instead, they just want to abandon uh, ether when they talk to the students of state instead of dealing with ether based motion. And ether based motion is in the sense of having an ether frame which would go by various different names like preferred frame or absolute frame. Dixon carries on and he says all this and what I point out and he's right into the problem of what was Einstein's 1905 special relativity paper based on? Was it based on the Michelson Morley experiment? Um, it's easy to assume that it was, is what many relativity texts do. But did Einstein know about the Michelson Morley experiment in 1905? Uh, so, so we can then know if his theory is based on it i.e. because theories need empirical support. You look for Einstein to answer that and he gives confusing answer course in, in the way that he often gives confusing answers. So I'm going into the question, did Einstein know of the michelson morley experiment in 1905? Uh, this Newsweek reports on the contradictory things Einstein said about this. I'll leave you to read that for a moment if you like. And my comments are on it. Einstein created lots of contradictions and hence created lots of arguing. And by the way, the Newsweek article is saying things uh, which I disagree with, such as saying there is no ether. So 
this report in that Einstein was contradictory upon what Einstein was saying about the Michelson Morley experiment, but then the Newsweek article makes statements which are, I consider false, such as falsely claiming there's no ether. So Dick, Dick, Dixon then goes on to deal with things like relativistic velocity addition, but I'm going to skip over that to pick up more about the ether. So this is what Dixon now says further on about the ether. Before following further along the path taken by Einstein, what of the ether question mark? And so he's saying all this. And so my comments on it are, so you can interpret things through the use of an ether. When says when he says relativity does not deny the existence of the ether, that means you can interpret things by using the ether. But it's just problematic as to what is supposed to be meant by ether. And when he says it, meaning uh, relativity is simply not interesting. Interested. Uh, that's when he says that it's not clear to me what he's supposed to mean by that. So Dixon then tries to argue that the ether is not needed in special relativity, and this is where I'm starting to disagree with him a lot. But but that is then tied into precisely what is meant by special relativity. For example, this person, Philip Gibbs, says it's a common misconception that special relativity cannot handle accelerating objects or accelerating reference frames. Sometimes it's claimed that general relativity is required for these situations. So there are people who are saying special relativity can't deal with acceleration and there are people who are saying that it can deal with acceleration. So this is an example of moving goalposts. You've got people who are making different claims as to what special relativity is, and that is moving goalposts. And here, here's my picture for the moving goalpost. Uh, oh, you've got the claim, special relativity can't deal with acceleration. Then you move the goalposts and you say special relativity can deal with acceleration. So you've got two versions of special relativity. Uh, difference being that people who say the first one that special relativity can't deal with acceleration, uh, they don't want to consider situations where there's acceleration. Or those who say special relativity can deal with acceleration, they're wanting to deal with situations where there is acceleration. And so there's similar problems with the ether. People who want situations where you don't want to consider ether versus those who do. You're moving the goalposts on acceleration, you're moving the goalposts on ether. So in the case of the twin paradox, the usual presentation of it is the rocket twin has gone on this journey and come back. Uh, it's a rocket twin that has a slower clock compared to the Earth-based twin. That means the Earth-based twin has the preferred absolute ether frame. You, what I mean by that is uh, it has the preferred frame, which you can also go by calling it the absolute frame, and you also go by calling it the ether frame. And it's not the case of uh, each twin says the other clock is slower after the journey. But anyway, as Dixon pointed out, ether is allowed by special relativity, despite the other things he's saying. And I've got this Nobel Prize winner in physics who spoke, says, one problem to overcome was the strong prejudice of good scientists who learned the lesson of the Michelson and Morley experiment and special relativity that there were no preferred frames of reference. Uh, there was an education job to convince them that this did not violate special 
relativity but did find a frame in which the expansion of the universe looked particularly simple and so he's saying the preferred frame exists and is allowed in special relativity which which we you could call the ether frame or whatever uh, and in other words physics students nowadays are usually being taught there is no preferred or frame in special relativity but the spook is saying that is wrong and now it's highlighted in this book of Dixon in 1968 uh, that it was being taught that there uh, It was not being taught that there is no ether in special relativity. It is thus a corruption in the teaching of special relativity that has happened since. And it's moving the goalposts once again, but in this case, a corrupting what is taught about relativity. There's a great deal of things in Dixon's book which you could start arguing about. But let's move on to this bit. He says, it certainly seems that general relativity ascribes to space something more than mere fitness to contain matter. Variable size and curvature apparently imply properties by which it can interact with matter and energy. One of these interactions has the result that the velocity of light, again, probably means speed of light, is not a unit strict universal constant but it's affected by uh, the curved space that is by the gravitational fields through which it passes the velocity is constant or probably means speed in a uniform field and for the weak weak fields uh, rather uniform fields prevailing in an intergalactic space the variation is slight so light speed varies but it's only very small, hardly of cosmological significance. At the risk of being repetitive, it must be emphasized and so forth. And so by velocity, I'm making a note that you probably really mean speed uh, because using the terms velocity of light uh, that way earlier, any meant speed. So unfortunately, nowadays the idea gets confusing because of talking about different types of light speed. You've got things like coordinate light speed and local light speed and so forth. So here he's clearly saying light speed is variable, but that now gets messed up by talking about these different light speeds. So my conclusions are, thus we don't have a consistency in what has been talked about Einstein's relativity over the decades. Finish, thank you, the end.